Welcome to the Woo Woo Way podcast. My name is Zeb Rice. Today's podcast is an edited audio version of the third in the Sunday teaching series that Brent Bolthouse hosted at his Southern California home. The full video is available on Vimeo, and you can find it by searching Brent and George's name on Google or on Vimeo itself. Before I introduce the talk itself, I should say that if you are curious for a bit of background on George, me, Wu Wei, or the podcast itself, you can just listen to one of the first four podcast episodes where I provide uh, that, that, that sort of an introduction. In this talk, you'll hear George take another tack at trying to explain to us how we wake up. And what you'll see is that the arc of the talk follows the outline of what he puts in, in what he calls these three different categories or types of methods that have been developed over human history for how to wake up. And the, the, three, the three types uh, are, number one, the good vehicle or method, two, the superior vehicle, and three, the supreme vehicle. Now, it gets a little confusing because these vehicles or labels are normally associated with, or they sound very similar to, anyway, various Buddhist teachings. But in my experience with George, he uses them in his own way. So when he says the superior vehicle, for example, don't be confused with Mahayana or great vehicle Buddhism. Um, I, my experience with George is that these terms were much more uh, encompassing. And he, I mean, it's sort of like he's taking 2,500 years of spiritual thought and, and religious development and his own personal uh, experience of, of going through the process of, of waking up. And he's, he's putting him into these inherently imperf imperfect um, and not all-encompassing buckets. Um, and I'm a little tentative on this because George didn't ever give, ac or at least that I was participating in any academic seminars, and he certainly was not a person that was giving religious sermons and wasn't doctrinal at all. And so, um, and I'm not an expert on comparative religions either. Uh, I'm just trying to kind of give my, um, my understanding from George's talks and my private conversations with him what these three different buckets are, because I, I do think it's very important for us to understand them. And he, he spends the whole talk pretty much kind of going, going through them. So I, I won't do it in, in any detail here, but just to kind of set the, the, the framework, um, I'll, I'll just go through these three. The first one is the good vehicle. George calls it the gradual method or the accumulation method. And, and he does that because you're accumulating understanding, skills, information, realizations, psychic abilities, sometimes physical attributes. And um, you do this on your path to, to waking up. And, you, you know, I, I, my understanding is that, that George would put really all religions as institutions into this category. I mean, religions, as, as George talked about them, were uh, institutions with, with rules that were designed to allow humans to tame their animal tendencies. You know, we, we have anger, fear, greed, lust, sadness, so on and so forth. And these religious traditions, forgetting about their many um, kind of darker, darker sides throughout our history and, and even today, have these these rules and systems and insights that that it's a proven method um, to number one tame our, our animal natures, two to improve our lives, and three realize our freedom eventually. Um, but what he's saying by calling it the the good or the gradual method is that it using these techniques sort of puts us on a path towards realizing freedom, our own freedom and our essence, but eventually, after a really long time, probably many lifetimes, and after a extraordinary amount of effort. So he, he always would say good things about it and, and, um, and said it worked, um, but he said there's, there's a better method, and that's called the superior method or superior vehicle. And he would call this method the, the, the letting go method sometimes, in contrast to the accumulation method of the good vehicle. And in the, if you listen to the last episode um, of the podcast, you, you learned about George's view on um, reality as illusory, and he established that that what what we experience as reality is not actually the truth of reality. And I provided in the intro some 
kind of scientific um, background to that as we learn more and more about the nature of the human mind and consciousness. Um, and so we, we experience reality, as I talked about in that, in that intro, through our imagination. And so what George is saying in the superior vehicle that you do is that you, be, because reality is perceived through imagine, our imagination, not actually what's happening out there, we have the power in our minds to let go of the things that don't conform to the truth of our own freedom. And in Buddhism, my understanding is that the practice of unconditionality, unconditionality is is the way of, of practicing this letting go. Again, George talks more about this. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just trying to give that sort of framework. And finally, the, the supreme vehicle, you, you, you have the best method. And as George explains it, you just believe you're free and you behave accordingly. Um, again, I'll let him go into it, but um, the, the, the books and, and, and sort of um, teachers or teachings that, that he most often referred to for this supreme vehicle would be the Diamond Sutra, the Tao Te Ching, and the words of Jesus um, as, as recorded, however imperfectly, in, in the Gospels. Um, the canonical and non-canonical ones. Now, in the context of his discussion of the different vehicles or methods of um, of mastery or or uh, realizing our freedom, he mentions this important point about taking responsibility and and um, the key to breaking these these old habits is is training the subconscious, and this is one of my favorite teachings of, of George's or, or favorite uh, teaching approaches of his. Um, and, and what he says is, how, in answer to the question, how do you train? How do you do the things that are going to bring you along the path? He says, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, you just have to be doing something. You know, it, 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 there's lots of different ways. I mean, it doesn't matter in the sense that of all the many ways that have been um, developed over the, the eons by all these different cultures. It doesn't matter which one you go with as long as you're, you're doing it in a, in a disciplined fashion. So there's meditation, there's contemplation, there's prayer, there's qigong, there's tai chi, there's yoga. There's all these different methods from all these different traditions. And the, the, the key point, as he makes several times in the talk, is that the first thing that these things do is they keep you from doing the dysfunctional things. Um, so that's, uh, that's just something to look out for that, that I think is a, is a wonderful, wonderful teaching of his. So, um, so that, that, that's the, the first thing I wanted to do in this intro was talk about the, the kind of three methods. The second one is that uh, he makes a mention in passing of wanting as the root of suffering. And he'll talk a lot more about this. We'll re revisit this. But um, we've got a... Uh, a Buddhist teaching, which is just just extraordinary, and and not just um, used uh, by George in his teachings, but is something that is one of the great insights of of human humanity. And and so I thought I'd just spend a quick minute on on what that is. So what what are the four noble truths? The first is the truth of suffering. The second is the cause of suffering. Third is the end of suffering, and fourth is the way to end suffering. And I'll just cover those very briefly. The truth of suffering is basically saying that suffering is, is a defining characteristic of our existence. The Pali word is, is actually, uh, as I understand it, dukkha, which really means unsatisfactoriness. Um, and and I, th I find the unsatisfactoriness a much better translation than suffering because when you hear the word suffering, you just think bad stuff. But actually what this truth is talking about is is that it's good and bad things are included here. If, if, it's, if it's in the phenomenal world, if we're experiencing something coming into us from the physical or phenomenal world, those, the experience of that is going to be just by definition inherently unsatisfying because a phenomenal world is by definition transitory, it changes, and anything that changes is going to be unsatisfying because it, it, it goes away. And, and George breaks this down into, into, into a few different categories, but that shifts us over to the third um, noble truth, which is the cause of suffering. The cause of suffering is our craving or attachment. And, and the categories George breaks it down into are resisting, holding, and wanting. So, so in answer to the question, why do we suffer? 
we suffer because we want the good stuff and we don't want the bad stuff. So we we find that we resist anything that's not good. Um, we we hold and try to keep sustaining the things that that are good. And and then and if we don't have things that that, that are good, then then we we're in a, a place of wanting and and lack. And so that that's that's the cause of suffering. George talks about this stuff a lot. So I'll leave the second noble truth uh, at that. The third noble truth is that suffering can end and that there's a method. And the fourth is the method itself. Um, George offers our, our, his own take. Um, but for those that are interested in the Buddhist take on this, there are many sources, but I believe one of the um, good ones uh, is, is, is called the Dhammakaka Papatana Sutta, um, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, and there, it's, it's mentioned a lot in the Buddhist canon, so you can find other places. But if you, if you want to go more for a contemporary um, uh, Western-originated uh, Buddhist teacher, I would direct you to uh, people like Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, or Ram Das. Uh, you find that in their books, on their websites, the interviews they've done, their podcasts that they do, um, they all do a, an extraordinary job uh, of, of explaining this concept of the Four, four Noble Truths. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave the Four Noble Truths at that. There have been countless books and Dharma talks and um, lectures and uh, discussions over the millennia on, on these truths. So I, I'm certainly not intending to do any justice to to it here. Rather, I'm just trying to um, refresh the idea for those that uh, are familiar with it and introduce it for those that aren't, because um, I think it's important background context for listening to, to George. Finally, just a couple very minor comments um, so you can understand uh, uh, a couple of the comments um, George makes. One is uh, the talk takes home, as I said, at Brent Bolthouse's home, which is a few blocks from the beach. So he makes reference to, to being close to the ocean. Just be aware of what, what he means by that. Second, Brent's dog is, is named Endo. So when he talks about Endo, it's not a person, it's, it's a dog. Uh, and finally, uh, don't miss the, the comment that, that George makes that, that somebody pages him. And yes, this was filmed and, and recorded in 2013, and, and George was still using a pager, which I just think was, uh, which is just so, so awesome. Um, he, uh, he was a, a wonderful man and had uh, went many wonderful uh, uh, characteristics, but I, I thought that, that he still used a pager in 2013. It was certainly uh, unique. Anyway, uh, that's it for me on an, on an intro, and, uh, and so I'll hand it over to George. Nice to see all of you. Some of you are new. Uh, you know, sometimes over time, you get a historical perspective. And so many of these principles began in India. And it was an interesting group of people who were very dedicated to these principles. So, so often when we need categories, we go back to the Hindus because, again, they had a lot of people who were interested in these principles and they took the time to categorize them. But as the information moved from India, ultimately to Japan, along the way after centuries, people start to get perspectives and they start to organize the information and look at it and start to make comparisons. So that's where we're going to start because A, I always tell you we're gonna start out with the truth. Right now, right here, you're free. And if that is not a realization to you, then what am I going to tell you other than you have to inspect what it is you do that blocks that awareness? So what do we practice? Letting go, breaking habits, and being still. Because if you're free, then there must be something about you that is in no way capable of being bound, touched, or altered in any way. There must be something about you. Otherwise, the statement wouldn't be true. So if that's not apparent, then you have to inspect what it is you're doing in your life. So in China, the fact that I've just told you that 
right now, right here, you are free. It's called the open secret. Now, why is it called an open secret? Because once you see it, you say, whoa, it was always here. So it was only a secret until I realized it. And once you realize it, well, it's not a secret, and it's everywhere at the same time. Okay? So, perspective. So after a while, in looking back in history, there began to develop an attitude that there was a good doctrine, vehicle, to get to the goal. And usually we would associate it with religion and metaphysics. Now, it was called a good doctrine, vehicle, because it could get you to that final realization, but it had two disadvantages. One, it really helped create a better human physical life. And so it was very easy to get wrapped up in the well-being of the body, the well-being of relationships, the well-being of your business, and you were enjoying more and more progress, right, and success, so it was very easy to sort of just be complacent, sort of just keep enjoying the good stuff. Number two, it took a long time. Now, it took Buddha something like 800 lifetimes, and he was diligent, so it can take a long time. But again, things get better. And so when we're talking about the good vehicle, right, we're, we're talking about metaphysics, uh, the law of attraction, uh, manifestations, and uh, uh, demonstrations. And so again, again, it can promote a pretty good life, physical life. Certainly better than what most people are doing in their life. But again, the perks, the improvements, the success can sort of get us stuck and complacent. So they said there was a, a superior method. I guess we could associate it with mysticism, spirituality, and that's not as attractive. One of the reasons it's not as attractive is because you got to get to work. It requires discipline. That's why it's not that attractive, okay? Right off hand, you can't really see the benefits. I mean, after all, it actually really seems more like deprivation initially, okay? Like you got to detoxify the body, right? So that means you got to start changing your diet and you got to start practicing, you know, uh, directing your physical body. You got to start directing your emotions, your mind, etc. So it, it doesn't look that inviting, okay? But they're considered it to be a superior method to waking up to that final, oh my goodness, that is the truth, okay? So when I say to you, we're just one agreement apart, that, that's all, you know, it's just one agreement apart. I'm telling you right now, right here, you're free, and some of you don't agree with me. So th that's, that's the only problem, right? You just don't agree. And you have good evidence why you don't agree. I mean, you can tell me your woes, right? You can tell me all the things that get in your way, distract you, uh, disturb your peace. And so how can you be free? You have all these turmoils in your life, and I hope I'm not talking to this group, right, that, that we're talking about somebody you know, right? They're the ones with turmoils. You, you don't have any, right? You don't have any health problems or anything like that. But that's not true of the average person. So in the superior way, you actually, like I said, it's not as attractive because you actually have to say, well, okay, I'm going to sort of, to some degree, postpone the benefits that I've gained. I, I don't have to start suffering, but I'm going to postpone them. In other words, I'm going to shift my focus, and I'm going to start the process of introspection. Now, I've given you two assignments, right? And the assignments were based on what? Pay attention. That's all, pay attention. Because otherwise, we're walking through life unconsciously. So you start to pay attention. And not only do you start to pay attention, one of the assignments was what? Start to take responsibility for the emotional responses that you're creating. But isn't responsibility 
one of the first major steps out of the dysfunctional pattern? Think about it. Responsibility is one of the first elements, very significant element, to get out of the dysfunctional pattern. Now, what's the sad news? Okay, I tell you, I tend to be a little generous, right? And, but I say that, and I'm generous, by the way, okay? That 80% of the people, 80% of the people basically have the dysfunctional personality profile. Okay? So the first step is to start taking responsibility. And what's one of the outstanding characteristics of the dysfunctional profile? Blaming. But you don't call it blaming. You, you actually call it explanations or justifications, right? You say, well, the reason I'm angry is because Brian said, or Brian didn't do, right? So you don't call it blaming. But that's basically what you're doing. You're assigning the power of what's going on within you to somebody else, some situation, or a thing. You'd be a heck of a lot better off saying, you know, <laughs> on the way over here, this young man was paging me again. Well, how do you feel, Jeff? Depressed, anxious, and frightened. Jeff, since I know him, right? Well, we've worked together. Why would you, why would you generate those feelings? Oh, no, I, it, it was because my girlfriend uh, severed the relationship. So, wow, I thought that was step number one. <laughs> we don't blame others for our feelings. So what are we going to do? Let's try something else. Ten minutes later, I say, how do you feel? I feel good. Well, when did this breakup happen? Friday. So you've been suffering from Friday to today? I mean, think about it. <laughs> he forgot to do the exercises. And why would, he, why would you forget? Because you've assigned the power to something else, right? I mean, so you're saying if he, she, it changed, I wouldn't have the problem. So the first step in moving into, let's call it the mystical, spiritual path, is to start to take responsibility. <coughs> And as I say to you, sometimes you're going to be better off. It's going to be more instructional for you to assume 100% responsibility, although that is seldom, believe me, that is seldom true, that you're 100% responsible for, for whatever is going on. You don't have that power yet, okay? I mean, you do, but you don't know that. You actually do have it, but you don't know that yet, okay? So, but it's very helpful because what's another outstanding characteristic of the dysfunctional pattern? Denial. See, denial. So if you assume 100% responsibility, it kind of closes the door on being in denial. Okay? So th that's why it's advantageous to start out with assuming 100% responsibility for whatever happened, right? So if we've worked together, right? So Fernanda says to me, well, this was the situation, right? And I say, okay, Fernanda, what did you do to cause it? And if she's paying attention, she's going to say, uh, that's what I did to cause it, okay? I don't know why I did that, but that's what I did. If she's not paying attention, what is she going to say? It just happened. He's that way. She's that way. <laughs> but if she's paying attention, she's going to say what? I did this. I said this. I didn't say this. I didn't do this. Okay? See, responsibility is the first major step to get out of the dysfunctional pattern. Now, so what's so bad about the dysfunctional pattern? Come on, if 80% of the people are doing it, well, just take the word, okay? The word dysfunctional means it doesn't work. What doesn't work? What is it you're after? Being happy. Isn't that it? I mean, aren't you trying to be happy? Well, if you're using the dysfunctional pattern, you don't have much chance of being successful at being happy. So you may have moments, right? You may have moments of reprieve. 
but I doubt you'll describe your life as happy. You'll have happy moments where you'll distract yourself, numb yourself, but that's not necessarily how you're going to describe your life. All right? So you start to take responsibility, but it requires, again, that you start to pay attention. See? To start to pay attention and keep it as simple as possible. So you start to master the function of the body. And most of you are doing that already. I mean, you know, the disciplines like yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong. And, you know, the, those kinds of disciplines help you start to master the body. Usually where we fall short is directing the subconscious. And there's a good reason for calling it the subconscious, because most of us aren't aware of what it's doing. Right? It's just not aware of what it's doing. The associations it's making. And the reason is that part of us isn't very good at tracking time. So it'll collapse time. So something that happened when you were in the third grade and those emotional responses is what you're doing now as an adult. Okay. The other problem is most of us, even if we have an inkling of what our subconscious mind is doing, we try to reason with it. Okay. And I was so happy when Brent got endo because uh, I was trying to train Brent to have an intellectual communication dialogue with endo and see what results he got. And you could imagine the results he got intellectually communicating with Endo, right? That's what we try to do with the subconscious mind. We tr actually try to educate it, reason with it. And it doesn't function that way. So your attitude has to be, and that's why we say mastery, you have to train your subconscious. You educate the conscious mind. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And it is a value to educate the conscious mind because now you can use that part to help you with the other part, you see, to, to help you deal with the subconscious and help you deal with the body. Within the superior method or vehicle, if you wish, uh, you're going to learn to meditate, contemplate, those kinds of things. Because again, if nothing else what those disciplines do is keep you from doing the things that got you in trouble. I mean, really, just make it very practical and very simple. I mean, I try to tell you, it's simple, natural, and organic. After all, if right now, right here, you are free, I mean, what else is there to do but to figure out why you don't see it? So it's got to be simple. You're not going to be something tomorrow that you're not today. You're not going to be something tomorrow that you weren't five years ago. You're it right now. Because your essence is constant. You cannot add to it, and you cannot subtract to it. You have to figure out the trick you're using to fool yourself. What else can it be? If you cannot add to your essence and you cannot subtract from it, then you must be fooling yourself somehow. So what will you gain when, as the Chinese would say, you become fully awakened? What will you have gained? Nothing other than the realization. It's kind of like you finally figured out that 2 plus 2 is 4, right? It's like, oh yeah, 2 plus 2 is 4. What did you gain? Just that awareness that it's for. Your essence will not have changed. We cannot add to you. We cannot subtract from you. And yet, what is the major concern of the average person? Wanting. Wanting is the bane of the average person. And how did the Buddha put it? It is the root, the basis of all misery. Wanting. Well, why would you want? 
because you perceive lack. And I just finished telling you, there's nothing that can be added to you. And there's nothing that can be taken away from you. If you realize that, how could you experience lack? And why would you try to accumulate? Where would you put it? Where would you put whatever it is you think you need to accumulate and have? So the game changes. See, you're not going to deal with life in a very different way. By the way, uh, I hope you realize you don't have to check out of the game, right? It's just, you're just going to play it in a different way. That's all. Okay? It's like you're now playing with the house money. <laughs> There's nothing you're going to lose. So you, you, know, you, you can be very adventurous, right? And try all kinds of tricks because, you know, not only are you playing with the house money, they have guaranteed you that you will have the funds for the whole night, right? So it doesn't matter what you lose during the night. I mean, you know, you're, you're, they're just going to keep replenishing it. So, meditation, contemplation, are just disciplines to help you break habits. What meditation system? What contemplative system? Any system that has survived the test of time. That's it. Is there a better system than another? Nah. Your intention, your dedication, your focus to the system is more important than the system. Okay, that, that, That's why there's so many. Because that's not what's important. Okay? Just like when you're meditating, you're not gossiping. Right? See? It's like, oh, see? So you're not reinforcing the wrong thing. So the method is really secondary to your intent, to your dedication. So I try to give this analogy, okay? One of you decides you're going to be a dentist, okay? And I say, okay, so do you have a bachelor's degree? No. Nope. Okay, so uh, I think you're probably going to need a bachelor's degree first, okay? So uh, how do you think you're going to handle it? Well, I think I'll take a Semester a year. Go, whoa. <laughs> and it's going to take a while, right? If you're going to take one course a semester a year, yeah, it's going to take a while. And then there's going to be graduate school, and then you're going to go to dental school, and then, boy, I mean, it's going to take a long time. Well, some of us handle the disciplines like that. If we're really paying attention, remember, it's the name of the game, right? You're going to pay attention. You can't change something you're not aware of. And I ask you, how often, how long do you meditate? So I said to this young man, you know, I keep telling you, you can't use meditation like an aspirin. Don't take it when you got a headache. Get to the point you don't need the aspirin. Okay? So you start out by being honest, right? I mean, what amount of time? How frequent do you apply whatever process you want to use? And if you're like this hypothetical dental student, it's going to take a long time. Why? Not because you're not free, but because you keep reinforcing the very thing that has clouded your perception to that fact. I mean, after all, you're the one that did it to yourself, so who else can undo it? Do you understand? I mean, you're the one that hypnotized yourself, so who else can unhypnotize you? Oh, I can give you the suggestion. Okay, at the count of three, you will be free. One, two, three. Oh, it didn't work, George. I'm not free. <laughs> See, I gave her the suggestion. She didn't take it. So it didn't do any good. Why? Because you've been practicing without paying attention. Self-hypnosis. You're just not paying attention. You're the hypnotist and the client. 
except you're not paying attention. Or you'd probably say, why in the world would I give myself that suggestion? It's not going to help me. And you'd stop. So we practice these disciplines. And again, very empirical. So I would say to you, whatever discipline you're using, meditative, contemplative, prayer, okay, a variety of types of prayer, Hopefully it's not the supplication type, right? <laughs> the, the, the problem with supplication prayer is what? It's already started from the wrong premise. Lack. So you're already in the wrong frequency, okay? But there are other forms of prayer that can be of value. So whatever the method is, it should lead to you beginning to experience subjectively. If you're a visual person, we usually talk as if you are a visual person. Okay? If you're a visual person, the experience of luminosity in your consciousness. If whatever method you're using leads to a sense of the presence of luminosity in your consciousness, it's a good method. Keep doing it until this luminosity continues to grow, as it were, it basically covers your whole field of consciousness. And then, as it happens, so I'll say something peripherally, we're going to put it together. Remember I've said to you before, every level of consciousness is going to give you a sense of identity. See, whatever and however you define yourself, if you'll tell me what it is, I'll tell you what the dominant consciousness you have. Because every level gives you a sense of identity. It gives you a worldview. It gives you a perception of reality. We're always revealing to each other where we are. We just aren't paying attention. So, partially then, the method that you're using should lead to a change in identity. If these illuminating experiences increase, either in frequency or duration, it should lead to this point of shift in identity where you identify as the light. That's what is meant by to be enlightened. So if you're not conscious right now of being light, then you haven't mastered that method. Just think of how you introduce yourself. Think of how you talk about yourself to others. And invariably, isn't your introduction and how you think about yourself related to the body, the, the sexuality of the body, the, the activity of the body, the self, feelings, and thoughts. Well, relative to the goal, relative to waking up, that's a very low frequency. You're not going to get there from that starting point. And another time I've said to you before, what the average person is doing is tantamount to we here trying to see the ocean. We know it's out there, but we can't see it because we're not in the frequency. We're not in that consciousness that would reveal it. And that's why that first method, though called good, right, kind of keeps you in this beautiful environment, pleasant, comfortable. Kind of smell the ocean periodically, but you don't get to experience it. So the first major change has to be to stop identifying with your body and yourself. Does it mean you have annihilated the body or the self? No. You know, you, you don't identify with the tree. 
You don't identify with your car. So, if you will believe, I don't gain anything by telling you the truth. <laughs> okay? You don't even have to show up next week. So it's not even like, oh, wow, you know, that they're going to keep showing up. What do you have to lose? Some time? Some energy? But when you think of the possible rewards, I would imagine you would be highly motivated to, the, to know the truth about yourself and to wander free. To be like Whitman. Griefs and lamentations, what have I to do with them? Others may have them, <laughs> but I have none. I am at peace, in love, at rest, wherever I am. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have that consciousness? To know you can. So what did Pontius Pilate say to Jesus? You know, I have the power to free you or have you crucified. And what did he say? You have no power over me. Imagine that, okay? I can pick up my life anytime I want. You have no power over me. If it is not advantageous for this event to occur, it will not occur. And by the way, he had already demonstrated ample times that if he didn't want to be there, he wasn't going to be there, right? <laughs> he would already escaped several times, so if he didn't want to be there, he wouldn't have been there. But that's secondary to knowing what? You cannot take my life. I have the power. What's the number one fear of the race? Death. You know, we're so frightened of it, we won't even admit it. I mean, we will not even admit that death is our number one concern. Ah, oh, we dress it up as success, we dress it up, you know, oh, you know, my number one concern is fear of not successful, fear of not being in a good relationship, fear of not having a good family, fear of, it's just death. It's just fear of death. Because you forgot. You have the power. So I invite you to inspect what you do, and somewhere in there, you'll discover what the trick you played on yourself, what it was, probably still doing it, and that's why you haven't woken up. So the superior method, not very attractive, not at all, but again, Serving the purpose of shortening the amount of time it takes to wake up? It is the superior method. But what if you don't want to wake up? Well, then obviously you won't be attracted to it. Okay? So until you think that's important enough, that's not what you will dedicate your life to. To waking up, being imperturbable in the midst of chaos because your brethren are still going to be dysfunctional aren't they <laughs> you know just because you're imperturbable doesn't mean you, you know everybody around you is all of a sudden going to be healthy if 80 percent of the people are dysfunctional aren't you going to find them in every realm of life the medical profession the educational profession yoga 
right? I mean, you're going to find dysfunctional patterns in every aspect of life. But to be conscious that it's not affecting you, that in no way is it diminishing your blissful, loving peace. Eh, maybe it doesn't sound that attractive to you. Maybe you like drama. <laughs> right? But if and when you get tired of drama, heartaches, etc., then maybe you'll get motivated. But how far away are you? One aha. One aha. Now remember earlier I said the methods are secondary. And the reason for that is we don't know what will prompt you. So who has the responsibility? You do. We don't know what will prompt you to wake up. So I tell you stories, I tell you jokes, I give you things to do, because we don't know what stimulus will be the thing that you will take and say, okay, that's enough. I'll wake up now. Okay. So, do I teach you a method? Yeah. Do I care what method you use? No. As long as it produces certain stages of waking up, you're okay. Preferably, you'll start out with the truth, and then you don't have to go through stages. But if that's not what you're going to do, then, you know, just proceed in the journey. And little by little, you'll become more awake. You'll see things you didn't see before. And actually, you haven't seen them for a long time, by the way. Okay, You, you, you did see them at one time. You just haven't seen them for a long time. And then pretty soon again, you will know the truth about yourself. And we use the word self very loosely, but we're going to use it right now. And you will proceed through life imperturbable, blissfully loving, peaceful state of consciousness, awareness. As you deal with the dysfunctional people in our lives. So in the process, you'll become more compassionate, more empathic, because you realize, wow, you know, I was there once, you know, I'm not there, and if they don't see it, uh, I can see why they don't see it, but, you know, maybe by holding the truth about them, I'll serve some purpose. But you cannot wake them up. Okay? You didn't put them to sleep. You can't wake them up. They will make that decision by and by. Okay? All right? So, so it's part of the process for you to pay attention, right? Let's give you an assignment. For the week, every time you're aware of an emotion, ask yourself this question. What previous situation does this emotion remind me of? Okay, so whatever the emotion is, what previous situation does this emotion remind me of? And why did I generate it in the first place? You know, by the, you know, we can almost safely say, you know, looking at the chronological age of the group here, that you, you probably have very, 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 very few new emotions. You've already gone through the gamut of emotions, okay? It's going to be very hard for you at this point 
to have a new emotion. So almost every emotion you have is a historically based emotion. And why am I asking you to do this? So you start to pay attention and start to take responsibility. Okay. Because if you don't start there, I, I don't know again how you're going to wake up. Right? A good method, good life. A superior method, enlightenment. The supreme method, fully awakened. Just like going to the grocery. What are you going to choose? Okay? All right, well, I, I hope I've given you some frame of reference that you could start putting things together, you know, because, again, it just sort of helps organize our thinking and things of that nature, okay? And then we proceed. So with that, are there any questions? Anything you might need clarification? Poke up. Okay? It's always good to find those kinds of examples. Okay? So when asked, right, what, what would be the, the, the intellectual question to ask? What method did you use? <laughs> what, what did you do? You know what he said? My guru said I was free, and I believed him. That was his method. He said I was free. And I believed him, and I started behaving accordingly. I believed him. Now, I keep saying to you, I'm telling you you're free. Shouldn't you ask yourself the question, what's he got to gain by telling us that? And if your conclusion is what? Then what would I tell you? Yes, dear. Once we identify what, when the first time we felt that emotion is, what, what should we do with that? The second part was what? Ask yourself, why did I create it? Then or now, or both? Both, both. Okay. So first of all, you're going to say, right? What did I create? What was the feeling? So let's just say, let's just use one. Okay. Let's say you're aware of anger. Right. So you're going to ask yourself. When, at another time, did I have this anger? Oh, in the third grade. Okay, third grade. Because you're trying to show yourself that what? What you're feeling today is historical. Then you're going to ask the question, what? Why did I choose that emotion? Then, and obviously you must have chosen it today. And by the way, initially, you might not get anything back. And there's a, there's a reason for that, okay? Because you don't have a working relationship yet with your subconscious mind. But eventually, I'll just give you the information. Okay? Right? Any other question? We'll go out and practice, and good luck. Good night. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the podcast, there are a few ways that you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes. You can tell your friends about it, share it on social media. Um, you can subscribe to it so it automatically comes into your feed. Um, and finally, for any feedback uh, or if you'd like to find more information on Wu Wei or George Falcon, you can go to the website, www.wuwei.net. Uh, or feel free to email me at zeb at uwuwei.net. Thanks as always for listening. We'll see you next time.